about Sage Dynamics. What kind of training do you do? Well, and, and I kind of got into that before the last break. Uh, once I decided to leave full-time law enforcement and teach full-time, and the decision kind of happened before that, uh, I, I looked at all the skill sets, what's most likely to happen all the way to what's least likely to happen. And, and what I realized is there's a lot of training out there that, that some ex-law enforcement or ex-military trainers would be like, well, civilians don't need to know that. And me as an instructor, I have no business telling a citizen what he can and can't know. My job is to make sure he's proficient in the basics and slowly work him work his way up to the least likely situation. Most likely situation is probably going to be a self defense shooting in very close quarters. But does that mean a citizen doesn't have the right or should never experience or train using a rifle with a plate carrier and a helmet and all that? I mean, is it more likely to need that gear? Probably not. But since it's on the table, I think everyone ha should have a right to access that training. We should be as proficient as possible with our firearms. So we start with the most likely. We work our way towards the least likely. I've made a couple enemies doing it that way. I've got a couple of my former law enforcement friends or, or some of my mentors that are kind of, yeah, you really don't need to be teaching stuff like that to citizens. But I, I, there's a very, very short list of things involved in the military or law enforcement community that cannot be tailored to the citizen's lifestyle. And I think if the knowledge is there and it can help save one someone's life, there's no reason they shouldn't know. Yeah, one of the things I always think about is, you know, I see a lot of people, they go out, they get their CHL. That's a mm -hmm. great responsibility to have because number one, you're held to a higher standard. You've been through the classes. You're, you know, they're going to look at you in the court of law as someone who has more training, who's read the laws. So you've got to take it from just shooting targets to thinking outside the box, using the training that you guys at Sage Dynamics provide. So we're going to go to break again. We'll be back in just a little bit. I'm Joe Biggs with the InfoWars Overdrive Hour. Thank you. My guest today is Aaron Cohen of Sage Dynamics. If you're just now tuning in, we've been talking about different scenarios that you could go over, ways to think outside of the box. If you're someone who uh, is a concealed carry holder, you, uh, you exercise that right. You are a Second Amendment lover like myself. This is a way to think outside of the box, a way to put different scenarios in your head so you can go in ahead and have that in the back of your mind in case that happens. So first off, the money bomb has been extended on until Sunday. So if you'd like to call in and donate, please call the number 888-253-3139. And uh, we have a lot of great uh, uh, cells going on, specials as well. Both Survival Shield X2 nascent iodine and DNA Force are 25% off at the InfoWarsLife.com store. So go there, check that out. And once again, I'd like to thank all of our listeners out there who have helped make this money bomb the success it is today. Now, Aaron, let's talk about a different scenario. I've watched some of your videos where you talk about how to protect yourself, how to react if you're in your car, because being in your car is one of the most vulnerable places to be. Tell us something that, or give us people, uh, give the people out there something to think about if they find themselves in a situation where they're being attacked, maybe at an ATM or their car stopped at a red light at two o'clock in the morning. The things you have to think about where you should place your gun, should you have it holstered, should you have it outside the clip or outside the belt, inside, all that? Um, just general preparedness inside the vehicle. Um, obviously, keep attention to those mirrors. Find a way that'll keep at least some degree of situational awareness so you can know as much ahead of time that something may be happening. Uh, and and as gun carriers, we, we also have a big responsibility to be the bigger person in any kind of dispute. If, if you accidentally cut someone off or someone just thinks you cut them off, Apologize, because by engaging in an argument, you may escalate into a situation where you're forced to use your firearm. When it's simply apologizing, could avoid the situation altogether. Yeah. Now, and, you, if, and if when the you're person, the one that uh, injects that, and you're the one that creates yeah. that, then you're the one that's going to be held responsible because you're you, the concealed. You, you have no right to self-defense in a situation that you create. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as far as staging goes, me personally, I'm a hundred meters both way kind of guy. I put my seatbelt on about 100 meters after I leave wherever I'm going, and I take my seatbelt off about 100 meters before I get there. So if something happens, I've already cleared that seatbelt. I'm dominant left hand, so for me, seatbelts don't really get in my way until it's time to get out of the vehicle. I can draw my weapon, access my firearm, no problem with seatbelt on. As a right-handed shooter, if you're a hip carry guy, you may have to clear the seatbelt or at least navigate that lap belt before you can get to your firearm. Uh, when I get in the vehicle, I tuck my shirt behind my gun, so it's exposed, it's access. Now, some states would not allow you to do that. Some states will. Um, you obviously just have to know your local laws, and it's just impossible for me to keep up with all 50 states uh, concurrently. But 
when it comes to shooting inside the vehicle, uh, the windows are going to cause some deflection. They're also going to take a lot of the potency, uh, muzzle velocity off around. So if you find yourself in a situation where you have to engage from inside the cabin, uh, the biggest thing to know is that you're going probably going to have to shoot a few more rounds than you think you might just to be able to clear that glass out of your way or drive a hole through the glass, especially through the windshield. Uh, in order to create an effective bullet path where you're getting, un, un, I'd say, uninterrupted hits on your bad guy. Um, but again, the car itself is a weapon. Uh, if, if I find myself in a situation where the vehicle still has mobility, if I can drive up onto a sidewalk into a parking lot, or if I can pull into a suicide lane, or if I can back into something, any way I'm able to move the vehicle, I'm going to. It's when I can't move from the vehicle that the gun is going to be my primary means of self-defense. So what's some uh, different scenarios? You just recently came down to Texas, and I was trying to get out that way. Some different things popped up. I wasn't able to make out, uh, make it out there. But uh, what's some of the different training scenarios that you're teaching right now currently? What are people asking you to, uh, to help them out with? Uh, the industry tends to trend. Last year, uh, handgun classes were really popular. This year has been mostly rifle. People want a lot of rifle classes, and I think it's probably going to trend back into handgun next year. Um, the biggest thing is to focus on what's most likely, most likely situations. How how uh, proficient is your draw stroke? How quickly can you access your weapon? How quickly can you access your weapon and, and start delivering aimed fire on a close range threat? Uh, you're close, your, your threats are more likely than not going to be closer than they are further away. Now, being able to shoot at distance is super important, but the difference between shooting up close and shooting far away is time. The closer my threat is to me, the less time I have to deal with them and probably the less options I have available. So being able to shoot effectively in close quarters is hugely important. It's not magic or ninja science. It's just being able to run the fundamentals, so to speak, of the gun at real life speed and do so effectively in a very, very small margin distance of time. Now, once you get proficient at that, you can start building your way towards greater and greater and greater and greater distances. Um, but I think just being able to access the gun efficiently from a seated to standing on your back, on your side, in the field position, just being able to draw the gun from any body position you may find yourself in um, is a really good place to start once you understand the basic safety operations of the firearm and, you know, how to load it, how to unload it, how to fix malfunctions. Those, that, that's obviously very important, too. But accessing the weapon to me, especially if you carry concealed, is hugely important. That should be the first self-defense step that you take is really start practicing that. Now, uh, I, I just talked to Ryan Smith a minute ago. I actually had him on the other night for my three-hour oh. segment, and uh, he told me that you're going to be jumping on board with Armed Citizens United to help. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, Armed Citizens United is 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 a, what I think is a, a less uh, politically driven. I feel like it's a more socially driven activist group for 2A rights. Um, they're not going to have the same degree or risk of capitulation that you get from organizations like the NRA. I'm a lifetime NRA member. I'm an NRE LE instructor, but I don't feel that they are best representing my rights as a Second Amendment citizen. Uh, we still have the 1986 GCA. Like we got rid of the assault weapons ban, but that's because a sunset was written into it. The NRA had nothing to do with that. The NRA hasn't fixed anything or really repealed anything uh, as far as is, is really in recent history. So for me, I look at the younger organizations such as Armed Citizens United as a group that once they get their feet underneath, underneath them and really become a powerhouse in the 2A community, they're going to be the kind of group that's able to push back against the stuff that the NRA has just kind of accepted as, well, this is just how things are. Um, and I don't think, you know, that the Second Amendment wasn't written with restrictions. It was written as, this is your rights. So we need to get back to that. You know, the Volstead Act has been repealed for quite some time now, yet we still have the NFA. Uh, and I think that's unacceptable. All right, so uh, guess what? Uh, Donald Trump has now come out with his position and stance on the Second Amendment. It says Donald, Tra uh, Donald J. Uh, Trump uh, believes in the right to keep and bear arms. The Second Amendment to our Constitution is clear. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed upon, period. So if you guys want to go to his website, you can go read more about that. Also, like I said earlier, the money bomb has been extended on until Sunday. There's a lot of great specials still going on. We want to thank all of you out there. Now, Aaron, what's a good way for people to contact you? Tell me about your website, what it is, and uh, what it is that you're, that you're going to be able to do if someone calls you and maybe get them out there to help them out. Well, I'm, uh, 
Website is sagedynamics.org. You can find my YouTube channel, YouTube forward slash Sage Dynamics. I'm on Instagram at Sage Dynamics, Twitter at Sage Dynamics. I think that's all my social media. Uh, I run classes all over the nation. Uh, I got to actually have a vehicle to plant defense class coming up next weekend here in the Atlanta area. Still have some slots left in that. That's going to be a live fire from the vehicle. We're going to shoot through real cars and go over all the techniques and skills that you need for defending yourself in, the, in a vehicle with a firearm with a handgun. Uh, but I also have classes, you know, nationwide. I'm building my 2016 calendar. Uh, I'll actually make it back out to Texas at least twice. So hopefully you can make it to one of those. Um, and I also do simunitions training, which is force on force. It allows you to physically experience as close as we can get it in training, the physiological and psychological stuff you go through in a gunfight. Or you well, may yeah, go through tell us more about that then. Give us a little bit more in depth on what that training is like. Well, I, I really think it's the bridge between what's artificial and what's real because on a live fire range we're shooting paper we should we should train to shoot people but we have to do it with paper so we can only make live fires so realistic because there's safety concerns simunitions allows people to take live guns convert them to fire a simunition round and shoot actual people so depending on the, the value of the role player whoever's playing the bad guy the more he puts into making the scenario believable the better training you're going to get out of it. And it's a really good way to dispel a lot of myths when it comes to how you're able to shoot accurately under stress and how people may behave under stress when you start shooting at them and they're shooting back. Um, I think that people should train on both sides of the house as much as possible. Live fire is priceless. You have to know how to fire a live firearm. But the force on force training allows you to do things that you just cannot do with live fire. Did you, do you do ever a, a stress training, anything like that, stress shooting, where you go out, you do like 100 push-ups, you get people yeah, to do that? I, mean, I, I include some physical exertion in my classes, but the, the physiological things that you encounter under just doing push-ups is not close to what you're going to encounter in an actual real-life stressful situation. It does teach you how to shoot under stress. Unfortunately, it's a different kind of stress. Yeah. Uh, your body becomes psychologically fatigued in the use of force. It doesn't often become physically fatigued unless you're actually in a hands-on physical fight. So how do you, uh, how do you prepare have, people then? How do you prepare people for the mental stress that will be involved uh, in? I've, I've seen heart rates up until up into the 200 beats per minute in simunitions classes. Now, again, heart rate is only a speedometer. It's not the engine. But it does get, it gives people the psychological aspect of a real use of force encounter. Um, having been in the real thing and used simunitions for a long time, I can tell you it's the closest you can get. It's not quite the same, but it's closer than anything I've ever done on a live fire range. So what are some of the different scenarios that you do in your simunitions training? Do you do indoors? Like yeah, I do. I do indoors. I do low light. I do home defense. I do vehicle defense. I do response to active shooter. Um, a bunch of different classes that cover those avenues. And I try to tailor the scenarios because every student's going to go through a number of scenarios. I try to tailor them to their individual life. I always ask students, what is it you do for a living? What are your, what are kind of your habits? Where are you most likely to encounter a situation? Uh, just to best prepare them because of their daily habits. Because, I mean, I get students in classes ever from trauma surgeons to guys that deliver carpet for a living, you know, and there's, there's honor in both positions, but they're going to experience different things in their lives. So I have to kind of tailor things as much as I can to their individual lifestyle. Now, I have a lot of people that'll tweet me and ask me uh, how they can protect themselves at their home. You brought up home invasion. What are some steps that people can take at home? They're laying in bed. It's two o'clock in the morning. They hear a bump. What are some actions that these people can kind of take a scenario they can play over in their mind so maybe they have a better chance of surviving if something does happen? Uh, biggest thing, if you do not have to leave the room, don't. Uh, if you live and it's just you or it's just you and a loved one and you have no kids, then you don't really have a reason to leave that bedroom. You can wait till the bad guy comes to you because you know where he's not, but you don't know where he is. He's not in the bedroom with you, so you actually don't know where he is in the house. You always want to fight for real estate that you own. Now, if you do have kids, then your primary focus is going to be go to get the kids. And then bring so, them back to your room. And, I, I, and really, it's hard for me to, to answer that as a, as a, as a cafeteria-style answer where one size fits all without knowing the individual, knowing the size of the home. And I got to be honest, people need to start thinking about not the 2 a.m. bump of the night, but the 2, the 2 p.m. knock on the door. Home defense doesn't mean you have the luxury of knowing when it's going to happen. It could happen at 2 in the afternoon, and when the bad guy kicks in that back door, it could be you, and then your wife's in the kitchen, the bad guy's on the other side of her. So now you have a loved one in between you and the bad guy. You need to start thinking about things like that as well. Home invasions and burglaries are two totally different things. All right, so so let's talk about that scenario then. There's a okay. knock on the door during uh, in the middle of the afternoon. You're home alone. 
How do you open the door? Do you open the door? Do you peek around? Do you put your foot down in front of the door so it can only open a certain amount of inches? Um, again, it's it's going to depend on the nature of 